Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Doug. Great to be here. So, so many people go through hardship and adversity in their life and they fall into the victim trap. You've been through so much hardship and adversity. And I'd love to know, like, what do you think can really help people escape the victim mindset? I never really thought of myself as a victim. I was sort of born almost into these circumstances of just, you know, severe instability and chaos and, um, you know, I, I guess like maybe objectively speaking, some some people could could think of me as a victim, but it wasn't it never really entered my mind that word or that way of thinking. Let's go back to the genesis of your story, at least from what you can remember. You're three years old. You're, you know, essentially like ripped away from your mother. What was going on there? Yeah. So I was born uh, in Los Angeles and my mom and I, my, my birth mother, she she never knew who my father was. I didn't know who my father was. So I obtained these documents later from a social worker responsible for my case. But essentially, you know, my mom and I, we lived in a, we were homeless. We lived in a car for a while. Then we moved into a slum apartment in LA and we kind of bounced around. And my mom apparently didn't know who my father was. She would have so random guys come over to this apartment at all hours of the day and night, um, exchanging favors for drugs. And I was in a different room, um, you know, according to these these documents, you know, I, she would basically lock me in this room, tie me up with um, a bathrobe belt and essentially just so that I couldn't interrupt her activities. Uh, and then after some instances of this, some neighbors called the cops because they heard me crying and the police arrived and saw what was going on here, just the sort of squalor and the chaos and the neglect, and basically took me into foster care. So my mom was uh, from, from Seoul, she was from South Korea, and she came to the US when she was a young woman. And my father, who I, I didn't know, it was only until like recently that I took this 23andMe DNA test, just so I could get a sense of who, where, you know, where he was from and everything. And I found out that he was uh, Hispanic, so he's ancestors from Mexico and Spain. And it wasn't that surprising, right? Like, I mean, it was, it was in LA. So like, I think the majority population now in LA is Hispanic. But so, so yeah, my, my, so, but I didn't know this. Like I went the first, whatever, 30 something years of my life, not knowing that I was half Mexican because I didn't know who my dad was. And so, so I was placed into foster care in LA um, and then lived in, yeah, seven different foster homes over the next few years. Yeah, that was essentially like the first half or early part of my, my childhood was just living in different homes and trying to, survive really i mean the early homes that i was in there were eight or ten plus foster siblings i mean the foster care system in general in the u.s is really screwed up but in la it's just, it's really bad um most sort of major major cities in the u.s there's just a an abundance of sort of neglected kids and there aren't that many families or homes that are willing to care for them and so often with these homes what happens is you know these parents will take in a bunch of them uh, maybe the hearts are in the right place, but then you have the situation where you have three or four kids to a room and there's nothing much you can do about it. And there are other foster parents too who will take kids and they'll receive the stipend. So e each kid you have, you know, they, the state will give you a stipend. They'll give you some amount of money. And so there is, there are some foster parents who do it specifically for sort of financial reasons, just to take as many kids as they can for the money. Um, but then, yeah, later on, I did live in a, in a home where I was the only foster child. And in that case, that was also for kind of self-serving reasons on the part of my foster mother, which we can get into that if you want. But yeah, I mean, that was basically it, just the foster homes, going to different schools. I mean, I was changing schools like every three or six months, really uh, bad student, really unfocused. At one point I was doing so badly in school, I had to take a, an IQ test because they assumed I had a learning disability, which I found strange, you know, in hindsight, just, you know, you move kid to different schools and different homes all the time, and he's not doing well in school. And people immediately jump to learning disability rather than focusing on kind of the the root issue of this kid isn't doing well because he doesn't he doesn't have like a stable family life or home. So and you talked about how you were in survival mode and you had to grow up. I'm I'm assuming super fast. You need to be aware to some extent of what was going on around you, even though you were so young. So talk a bit about like what that experience was like for you, like mentally and emotionally, because I feel like you know some people might say, oh, he was so young, it might he might not remember certain things, but you know, if you, as people read the book, like you had to like be alert and aware of what was going on, given how often you were moving around. So talk about how that all, how that impacted you on a, on a psychological level. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. So I've seen psychology studies on this that, um, that actually, so, so most people, their first memories are around three, four, sometimes five years old, but kids who experience like extreme distress or extreme trauma, they actually often have 
earlier memories. Like they're, they're, they sort of come online at an earlier age because of the experiences around them. And they encode those memories because they're so upsetting. And so, yeah, my, my early memories, three years old with my mom uh, being taken uh, into foster care. And yeah, I mean, if you're changing homes as, as a little kid, as a, as a small, vulnerable, physically unformidable child, yeah, you have to be sort of very alert, very aware who's in the house, who's not in the house, who's around, where the threats are, those kinds of things. And so that was one of the things like, you know, it, it was hard. It was hard for me just moving homes all the time. But the other thing that was hard was the day to day uncertainty about whether my foster siblings would be leaving or whether new kids would be arriving. That was the other thing that was hard was like maybe I'd form a friendship or a bond with one of my foster siblings. And then two weeks later, they'd be taken because whatever their mom got sober and was able to take care of them again. And then she would return, take the kid. And then two weeks after that, um, she would relapse and the kid would be taken from her. And then suddenly the foster sibling that I thought was gone forever was back. And then they, you know, it was like that cycle of revolving door of kids coming and going, not knowing who's going to be in the home. And so, yeah, I just learned to sort of be very alert and very sort of vigilant early on. It's exhausting to be in that state all the time. I mean, that was, that was a interesting piece of feedback I got from people was like, how did you remember all this stuff? I was like, I mean, you know, you, you sort of rapidly learn to sort of form memories and learn what's around you. And those things stick with you, especially early, early age stuff. I mean, like a lot of us, I think a lot of people, when they think back to like very vivid childhood memories, those things actually stick with you. And like a lot of my memories were vivid just because they were so um, novel and upsetting and emotionally charged. So yeah, I remember a lot from my early life and yeah, it was draining. It was exhausting. That's probably another reason why I wasn't doing well in school was just the sort of emotional exhaustion of sort of not, not having a stable uh, environment around me. When was the point where you started to really feel like emotionally like disconnected? Oh man. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, I, I read about this memory in the book, like the first time. So when I was taken from my mom, I, I write about like the just sort of um, emotional outburst that I had of crying and just sort of breaking down. And then when I was taken from my first foster home to the second one, I had a, the exact same reaction of just sort of pure terror and emotional pain. But then after that, it was the second, moving from the second to the third home. And then after that, it was just kind of blunted. At that point, it was like, I don't know, it just completely reconfigured my emotional systems and my wiring that I, um, I stopped crying. Like I, you know, just didn't have any emotional reaction whatsoever. I like became numb probably as a form of like coping or protection or something sort of self-protecting. Because if you have that, I mean, if you have that intense reaction every three or six months, like that's just going to like wreck a kid completely. So you, you know, the body, this, your psychology develops these coping responses to help you survive. So yeah, I mean, it was probably, how old was I? I mean, maybe six, five or six years old that, that started to occur that I became sort of emotionally blunted and sort of disconnected from my feelings. And I mean, in a way it probably made me a bit more kind of, I don't know, analytical or something in my outlook, maybe a bit more sort of cold, um, in some ways. Um, but it was also difficult. I mean, I paid for it later. Um, but it was, yeah, in the moment it was just, uh, really hard to experience all those feelings. And so, yeah, some kind of unconscious mechanism kicked in where, you know, just stop feeling those things because you have to survive and move forward. And also you don't want to be weak. I mean, that's the other thing, right? Like, especially when you reach like the age where when you're a really small kid, like a toddler or something and you cry, it's like the other kids are kind of like, oh, he's just a little kid, whatever. But once you reach the age where you're five, six, you're going to school now and you cry every time you get relocated, the other foster kids are going to pick up on it and start to bully you. And so that was like another reason to not show weakness or emotion. Talk about getting adopted, you know, by your, your family and what that experience was like. Yeah. So, so basically I was in this foster home, the seventh one in LA and yeah, my, the, these adoptive parents came in from, from Red Bluff, kind of a dusty blue collar town in Northern California, the Hendersons, they came, it was a man, a woman. Um, and then my, my younger sister, she was their birth daughter. She became my adoptive sister. They took me in. Yeah. I remember like my adoptive mom saying to call her mom, to call my adoptive father, call him dad. Like I'd never called anyone those names before, at least like to my knowledge, you know, maybe when I was like a really little kid or baby or something, I, I might've said those words, but, um, yeah, to, to finally be able to have a set of parents, a mom and a dad was really, um, yeah, it was just amazing. And then realizing I wouldn't have to move anymore. 
um, realizing like I had a, a sister and she would be my sister forever, not be taken and I wouldn't be taken from her. Yeah, it was really, uh, it was a really special moment for me. So I was seven, I was almost eight years old by this point and yeah, moved in with them, family home. It was really, um, one of the few periods of my childhood. I remember feeling this sort of unguarded kind of joy, this feeling of, of happiness. So yeah. And then, and then, yeah, I mean, it was, it lasted about, mm, about a year and a half, I want to say. And, uh, yeah. And then, and then from there kind of, kind of unraveled. I remember you talking about how much it meant to you for your sister, Hannah, to like share toys or something with you. Why was that so meaningful for you at that time? Uh, yeah. Well, I didn't have toys in the foster homes. I had, you know, sometimes what I would do is uh, some at the schools, they would have uh, like these Valentine's Day cars that the kids would pass around. Um, you know, it was like, you know, if you're going to bring Valentine's, you have to bring one for every other kid too. And so, um, yeah, the, the, the students would pass out, you know, it was like a Super Mario Valentine's card or uh, Sonic the Hedgehog or something. And I would just take these cards and stuff them in my pockets and go back to the foster home and I would put them in a little box and I would play with them like they were toys. And so those were the toys that I had. And then when I, and, and, yeah, when I visited my, my, my adoptive family when I was adopted and they finally took me in, yeah, I, I had this conversation with my younger sister where, you know, she had toys. She was just a normal kid in this family and she showed me all these toys and she was like, you know, these, you know, these are yours. Some of these are yours. Some of them are mine. I'm going to give you some of these toys. Uh, and yeah, it was just mind blowing that I had toys. They were mine. I could play with them whenever I wanted. Um, and yeah, it was like such a nice act too. I mean, some of the other foster kids in the, the, the homes that I was in, some of them had toys or like they brought a toy or maybe they stole some of these toys. And so there was always this feeling of like, okay, you have to share, or if someone has a toy, like if you try to play with it, they will like attack you or bite you or something. So like, okay, toys were like this very scarce resource. But then with my sister, she's like, you can just have them. It's fine. And I'm like, you know, just a completely new experience uh, for me. And so, yeah, it was, it was nice. I mean, it was, uh, the other thing was like birthdays. So my birthday is on December 18th. And so that overlaps with the holidays, with Christmas, with everything. And so my birthdays would pass unnoticed in the foster homes. And then, yeah, I started getting gifts when I was in, uh, when I was adopted and I had a, a family that would give me gifts. They would, they bought me a bike. It was, uh, yeah, it was a really nice, nice experience. But even that dream became shattered at one point. Talk a bit about your experience with your adopted family and how things started to, sh to shift. Yeah. I mean, my, my, uh, Adoptive mom and dad, you know, like I mentioned, about a, about a year and a half after the adoption, they uh, got a divorce. And you know, there was a period after that where my sister and I would go, we would sort of like bounce back and forth every week. You know, we'd, we'd stay at my mom's this week and our, our, yeah, our mom's this week, our dad's that week. And then um, at, at one point, my, uh, my mom sat me down and she was like, yeah, like, it's just going to be your sister going to your dad's this week. And I was really upset by this and I didn't understand why. And then later she kind of told me that, um, yeah, he, he doesn't want to see you. He's upset with me for leaving him. And this is like just a way for him to get revenge. Basically it was to just stop talking to you because he knows that this will hurt me. And, you know, there was a custody battle and there's all, you know, all this sort of court drama too, but eventually my mom got full custody of me and my adoptive dad just stopped talking to me. And so when I was nine years old by this point, and so, yeah, it was just hard. I mean, from not knowing who my birth father was, never meeting him. And in the foster homes, you know, it was, it was almost always women who were taking care of me and the other kids. Usually the foster dads weren't that involved. And so I didn't really have a dad. And then I finally had one. And then for him to stop talking to me, yeah, just, it was really, really painful. And then, you know, on top of that, to see that it, I could see that it was hurting my mom too. Like, I think she may have felt some guilt or felt some responsibility for this happening. I mean, it wasn't her fault, but I could understand why she would maybe feel, you know, to some extent, like, you know, and so, yeah, then, so yeah, so yeah then for a while, so my mom and I, we moved into this kind of gloomy duplex uh, in town. And yeah, she raised me for, for, uh, yeah, a few, a few months after that as a, as a single mom. And yeah, it was hard. I mean, seeing my sister sort of go to her dad's and then come back with us and, yeah, so the divorce was kind of disruptive. I remember I had mentioned before I wasn't doing very well in school in the foster homes. When I was adopted, I actually started to do well in school. I like got third place in the school spelling bee and I was like getting really good grades. And because I had this sort of stability at home and 
my mom and my dad, my adoptive parents were sort of looking over my shoulder to make sure I was actually paying attention in school and reading and everything. But then after the divorce, it was just um, so difficult for me that I stopped caring as much about my academic progress. My mom was working full time and she didn't really have as much sort of energy and time and attention to make sure that I was keeping up with everything I needed to keep up with at school. And yeah, I started hanging out with, you know, some, some troublemaking kids and that was fun for me. I mean, it was fun to get into trouble. And I mean, by yeah, nine years old, I was smoking cigarettes and drinking tequila and popping pills. <laughs> like, yeah, it was, uh, you know, that was sort of probably, I mean, it was pretty early to be doing those things, but it was fun. It was a way to sort of distract myself and forget about how, I guess, just how much, I don't know, pain, pain I was in from my dad and sort of disrupting, you know, the whole family just sort of falling apart. We'll get back to your, to your story in a second. You brought up an interesting point that I wanted to dive into because I know this is something that you're really passionate about and it's regarding the importance of like stability in a home with kids behavior and how they, you know, perform in school. Talk a bit about like the importance of the nuclear family and stability and what people might not be aware of as far as how it impacts people or how it impacts kids long term. Yeah, I mean it's it's so funny. We spend a lot of time talking about poverty and inequality and those kinds of things and I'm not saying like those are unimportant, but we spend comparatively little time on instability, which is actually a far stronger predictor of future harmful behaviors for kids. So, I mean, there's a really, um, really big study uh, that came out in 2012, and this team of psychologists essentially sort of tracked people and found that relative. So, so child poverty actually did not have any significant correlation for later life outcomes for addiction, crime, um, self-defeating behaviors, harmful behaviors, those kinds of things. Um, but childhood instability did. Um, and they measured instability with things like how frequently you relocated when you were a child, how many different homes you lived in, whether your parents were divorced, um, how many people moved in and out of your house on a daily basis, basically how much uncertainty and disorder you lived in as a kid. And that had a very strong and significant effect on later life outcomes for harmful behaviors, for addiction, for inclination to criminality, all of those kinds of things. And even when the researchers controlled for family socioeconomic status, there was still a significant link between child instability and harmful outcomes later in life. There was another study in 2016, which found a similar thing. I mean, they basically found that they compared uh, rich kids who lived in unstable uh, home lives. And there are, I mean, there are rich kids who have like unstable, I mean, you know, every, a lot of people know like rich, like money doesn't necessarily uh, guarantee stability. There are sort of rich families that are divorced and kind of crazy and kind of you know, there's addiction, there's all kinds of things that can plague wealthy, wealthy families too. So they measured the outcomes of kids who live in those kinds of environments with poor families that were married, that were stable, that were um, uh, nurturing and secure for children, and found that the kids in poor families that were stable had much better outcomes than the kids raised in wealthy homes in which there was a lot of instability and unpredictability in the child's life. And so to me, this just suggests that actually, yeah, instability is, is worse than um, than poverty or inequality alone in terms of child outcomes. Again, not saying that those things aren't important, but just instability, we should focus at least as much on that. And you can kind of see this too with um, sort of patterns of, of educational attainment. So for example, roughly 11% of kids in poor families in the US go on to graduate from college, which is pretty low. The average rate is something like 35%, roughly 35% of kids in the US go on to graduate from college. It's only 11% for kids in the bottom uh, income quintile. So poor kids, 11%, it's not great. But then if you look at the graduation rates for children in foster care, it's only 3%. And the thing is like foster homes, they're usually not like inordinately wealthy or anything, but they usually have to meet like a minimal level of material sustenance uh, in order to qualify to be a foster parent. So they're usually like working class or lower middle class. None of them are actually like impoverished or poor. Um, and yet the graduation rate is only 3%. Uh, in other words, a poor kid in the U S is four times more likely to graduate from college than a foster kid. So 
to me, this indicates that actually the instability of foster care, right? Like, yes, you're getting fed. Yes, like you have a roof over your head, those kinds of things when you're in foster care, but you're not getting those emotional inputs. You're having a lot of uncertainty and instability and emotional insecurity in your daily life. Those things will uh, affect your future odds of, of success. So I just think like, yeah, we should be focusing on family security, um, nurturing homes, warm environments, all of those kinds of things uh, if we want kids to succeed, but at least not fail, right? Like, okay, we want kids to go to college. We want kids to do well and get high paying jobs or whatever. But like the first thing we can think about is like, well, how do we get kids to sort of avoid harmful behaviors, addiction, uh, criminality, all of the kinds of things that could, that could lead their lives to go in catastrophic directions. And that would mean sort of ensuring that they have safe early home lives with um, attentive and nurturing parents or caregivers. What do you say to somebody and you started your book with this, where you didn't have a stable family growing up, and here you are. You've got, you know, you graduated from Yale. You've got your PhD. You're, you've had a lot of success now. You know, what do you say to somebody that says, "Well, look at you. You've been able to achieve a very meaningful life without any stability growing up." I mean, yeah, the the external sort of, you know, my resume looks pretty good, I guess. But it, the, the, you know, the, one of the points that I that I hope people will sort of take away from this book is that even if every foster kid um, grows up and goes on to go on to a fancy college and you know, become sort of conventionally successful that doesn't uh, heal the wounds or the scars of their early life. I mean, doesn't make up for it. You know, at one point I, I came to this realization and I, I write about it in my book about how I would swap my position in the top 1% of educational attainment of, uh, you know, getting, getting degrees from these elite universities to have never been in the top 1% of most unstable homes in the US of being in that sort of severe instability. And I think about that for my kids too. I mean, if I have the choice between putting my kid in sort of severe chaos and instability, uh, put them through the foster care system. I mean, just unimaginable to think like, I don't have kids, but just like thinking about putting them through that, just it's horrifying. So putting my kid in foster care, but knowing with the knowledge that, oh, but when they're older, they're gonna go to Yale or whatever, versus putting them in a stable home loving parents, whatever, you know, just having that sort of comfortable, uh, nurturing child childhood. And, you know, then they, they don't go on to be whatever as successful. They just live a sort of normal, whatever, just like a regular life. I would much rather them have that. Um, I would never want to put them through anything like, like, like what I went through. And so I just don't think it's worth it. I don't think the trade-off is worth it. That whole, I know it's popular in our culture, you know, because we want to, we, we want it to have meaning, right? We want that struggle and the difficulty to have meaning. And so we come up with these kind of trite adages about how, oh, I'm so glad I went through everything because it made me who I am today. Like, I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Like, I'm not glad I went through that. I, I wish I hadn't, even though maybe it may have led to, to, to my later success. I just don't think the trade-off was worth it at all. Um, and I would never want any kid to go through that. Um, and, and the thing is like, <laughs> I'm such a statistical outlier. Like most kids who start where I started, their lives actually don't get better. They get way worse over time. Like they do end up, I mean, I, you know, I, I write about the statistics in there about how 60% of boys who uh, live in foster homes are later incarcerated. And so for every one boy who went through foster care, like me, who goes to graduate from college, 20 are locked up, right? Like that's the expected outcome of someone who came from where I came from. And so it's just like, we have the, that, that way of thinking to me is just uh, completely misguided statistically, just everything is wrong. And then even the kids who sort of defy the statistics and do become successful, I don't think most of them uh, are, are, are sort of thinking in terms of, oh, well, it was good that all of that happened. I, I just don't think that's the, the way that, that uh, that's like not the right way to think about it. I mean, I've had people look at me and say, you're so lucky to have your story. And I'm like, man, do you even know like what I've had to deal with over the last like 15 years and the collateral damage that mentally and emotionally that, I mean, and I don't feel sorry for myself, but it's tough, it's tough, man, to like, you know, rebuild relationships and, you know, re relearn how to have healthy, you know, intimate relationships and, you know, the self-sabotaging behaviors, like all that stuff. Yeah, people only see the surface, right? They may see, um, you know, they see maybe with your podcast or with some of the external success. You know, we most of the time we don't we don't sort of divulge all of the sort of struggles and the costs and the setbacks that we went through. I mean, not yeah. I mean, professionally, yeah, maybe things look like they're going well, but yeah, relationships, friendships, romantic uh, entanglements, and sort of family issues, like all that stuff. Like I just 
you know, we're, of course, we're not going to air all of this stuff out. You know, I mean, I, I guess I did it in my book, but you know, it's usually not the the way that people deal with these things, right? Or just like that's not that's not how people communicate. And so, you know, it just because I've I've had people talk, tell me that too, like you know, wow, like what a, what an amazing story, and they 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 speak as if you know they're they're almost envious that I went through this. Like, whoa, well, you know, that's cool that you have this story and you can talk about it. It's like no, like I. Uh, I, I'm trying to, you know, like this is sort of how we deal with things, right? We try to make meaning. We try to sort of contextualize and and hopefully help give people meaningful messages as a result of the struggles and difficulties we went through. But it's not like something that anyone should be should be envious of. I mean, I hear people who have worse stories than mine. There are a lot of people who have had worse lives and everything than mine, and I hear it, and I'm like, because I have some sense, like I have an understanding of how how bad life can be. I feel none of that towards them of like, wow, it's so you had a crazier story than mine. Wow. That's so amazing. That's cool that you have that. It's like, no, I, I, I would never think that. So let's connect the dots a little bit. I mentioned that, you know, you went on to graduate from Yale and then you get a PhD and that you were an outlier in your ability to survive what you went through. So you're in this home with your adopted family, things are going great. They, they end up getting divorced. You end up now living with your mom. And then I believe she ends up getting into a relationship with another woman that lasted a good bit of time. And then I and then life continued to get worse, at least for you behaviorally and the way you beha- the way things went for you in school and aggression and and stuff like that. Talk a bit about like your experience from there and like what middle school and high school were like for you. Yeah. A few months in, after the divorce, my mom entered a relationship with this woman named Shelly. And initially it was actually fine from like nine, 10 years old to about 13, 14. This was like four or five year period where actually things were going pretty well. And my mom and Shelly actually created like a very sort of stable, conventional family life. I mean, they both worked full time, but you know, we had family dinners and they looked out for me and my sister, made sure we were sort of keeping up with our schoolwork and everything. And so there was a period, so middle school, essentially middle school was like actually a pretty good period of time for me where I was doing well in, in my grades and I was still getting into trouble here and there, but like not, not as bad as it was before. So I like, I had, I always, I always had that potential, I think, to be a little bit of a troublemaker, delinquent or whatever, like that, that latent thing was always there. I don't know if it was sort of whatever predisposition or as a result of the experiences in the foster homes or whatever you want to, you, you, you know, however whatever the explanations are there, that was there, that did exist within me. But when my mom and Shelly and whenever my family life, whenever things at home were okay, like I would at least sort of dedicate some of that energy and some of that restlessness into like doing well in school. I was always a curious kid. I liked to read. Um, and so I would try to do well. Well, yeah. So, so Shelly became a surrogate mother for me and I, I really um, grew, grew very attached to her. I mean, I, you know, I had so many, foster parents and you know my, my, my birth father my adoptive father you know all these people who came in and out of my life but Shelly actually despite not having any sort of legal obligation we weren't uh, related by blood but she sort of went out of her way to take care of me and treat me like her own son um, she was shot when I was uh, 14 right or 13 right before I started high school the summer after eighth grade and yeah, I mean, there was a period of of a few days where we weren't sure if she was going to survive, and then if so, like how badly her injury would sort of set her back, and it also like I mean, you know, it was medical bills piling up. Shelly couldn't work. My mom had to take time off to take care of Shelly. It was just like sort of emotionally, physically, financially, everything just became a lot more difficult. And so from that point, it was like, you know, all of that sort of stability that was so important for me. Um, to stay focused, just sort of fell by the wayside. And, you know, I, I, I always had like trouble making friends and I tried to resist getting into too much mischief with them. But at that point it was like every, everything at home was just so chaotic. And, you know, my mom was doing her best to keep the family financially afloat. And Shelly was just like not really present anymore because she was trying to recover. And, you know, we thought she might be paralyzed. Fortunately she wasn't. I mean, it took a long time. It took like a year of physical therapy for her to sort of get back on her feet. Literally. Yeah. From that point, it was like, you know, a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking, a lot of fist fights and yeah, like hanging out with my friends, hanging out with girls in the neighborhood and just really unfocused and just sort of seeking thrills, seeking ways to get high or get drunk or whatever, sort of distract myself. 
Yeah. And, and this was right when I was starting high school, which was like, I mean, just the timing was so, so bad because like, you know, that was when uh, I was starting to think at least a little bit about like, what am I going to do later on when I'm old enough? Am I going to go to college? What am I, you know, what does my future look like? And, you know, once, once uh, that, that tragedy occurred, like all of my concerns about school and grades went out the window and I stopped caring. Yeah, man, it was just like, from there, it was just a, a lot of like a series of bad decisions of drinking and driving and, you know, whatever, vandalizing buildings and, shooting pedestrians with paintball guns from our car and just like a lot of a lot of stupid stuff man like i mean a lot of it was was just fortunate that i like we didn't die. i mean I, I would drink and drive like probably more more often than not when i was on the road i was drunk when i was driving even in the mornings i mean like now it seems like horrifying like the thought of like drinking a bottle of like half gatorade half vodka at like 7 30 in the morning before school but at 16 or 17, like my friends and I would do that like a lot, <laughs> like, probably at least once or twice a week, we would just show up hammered to school and uh, just fall asleep, you know, get to class, fall asleep and whatever. Like, yeah, just, just, um, yeah, that was, that was kind of where, where, where my head was at, uh, at that age. Was all of that just in response to trying to deal with a lot of the emotional and mental pain that you had been going through in, in your life at that point? Or do you think a lot of it could just be attributed to just kids being kids. And that was just like what high school kids do. Like, do you, what do you think about that? I think it's both. I mean, I think it's like all of those factors play some role, right? Like, you know, but puberty, right? Like, you know, sort of the hormones kicking in, the testosterone, the anger, all of those things, aggression, impulsive, like those things just sort of naturally increase for every 13 or 14 year old boy. Like once you enter the teenage years, you know, your body changes and your whatever your priorities shift. Um, but I think that if you have like parents and people who are looking out for you and good mentors and coaches and whatever, like it can kind of contain that energy and channel it towards productive ends, whether it's sports, whether it's grades, whether it's whatever of just like, you know, yes, we understand that you're full of energy and aggression and whatever, but here are some productive avenues for you to, to, to direct that. But when it's not there, when those mentors and people and guardrails aren't around you, then it turns into like, how do we, you know, how do we get some weed? Like where, you know, who, who had like, how many of these, like, uh, uh, like, like cough medicine, how many of these pills can we take before we start to feel weird and high, you know, just like drinking and, and, and racing on the freeway and all those kinds of things. It was just, nothing was there to, to inhibit those, those impulses. Um, so I think it was like the natural effect of puberty in addition to all the sort of pain and I don't know all of the struggles of my early life trying to sort of work that out behaviorally in some way and then yeah just like being around a bunch of other teenage boys like that too I mean that was the thing like where I grew up in Red Bluff that was like my childhood was probably like a bit more extreme and whatever unusual but like my friends had kind of similar upbringings, you know, I had friends, most of, you know, I had two friends raised by a single mom, one friend raised by a single dad, another friend raised by his mom, or no, his grandma, because his, his dad, his dad was in prison. His mom was a drug addict. Like that was, that's like kind of a snapshot of what families look like in kind of working or lower middle class neighborhoods in America, at least, you know, in California where I, where I was living, it's like, if you, if, if for people who didn't go to college, for people who live kind of blue collar lives, like more and more families look like that now something like only 30 percent of working class uh, kids born into working class families are raised by both of their birth parents um you know i saw this firsthand i mean i knew a lot of teenage moms i knew a lot of people who just like didn't like never met their dad i mean that's like that's becoming more and more common now uh, it used to be mostly like impoverished sort of poor black neighborhoods that was kind of like the, the image of what you know, fatherlessness looked like, but now it's like kind of normalized, even in just sort of ordinary working lower middle class, like people who, um, you know, maybe ostensibly, like they're not, they're not impoverished, maybe they're broke, but they're not like extremely poor, but that's just kind of how things look like now. Um, and that's how it looked like, at least when I was growing up in the uh, early mid two thousands. And my guess is it's the same or even worse now. And so, yeah, all of those things, all of those things played a role, not having a dad, all of those things. I mean, it was all it was all a reaction to um, what was going on around me and, and internally. And then the thing that 
ended up really, I think, helping you, it seems, even though you had your some struggles along the way, was getting into the military. Talk about your experience joining the Air Force and how that really helped shape the trajectory of your life out of all of the chaos. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, I, it was not a well thought through decision to join. I mean, it was good that I did, but it was not like a carefully calculated. I mean, it was, it was, it was a bit of that. I had two, I wouldn't even call them mentors. That's too strong a word, but two people I respected. I, so my, my senior year of high school, I actually, I moved out early. Like I was 16 when I moved out and I moved in with my friend, his brother and his dad when I was 16 for my final year of high school. Um, and my friend's dad, who I lived with, I mean, he wasn't really home that often. He was, he worked as a private investigator. So he was like traveling on the road or just gone most of the time, but he was in the air force. Um, and I thought he was like a cool guy. He had this kind of cool job and he was a retired cop. And so, yeah, I had a lot of respect for him. He was in the air force, so he recommended it. And then one of my teachers who I liked, he was one of these like sort of astute teachers who could tell that I was smart, even though like I didn't do homework and I was kind of a smart ass in class. And I was just kind of whatever, like un unfocused, but he could tell that I was a smart kid and he recommended that I, I enlist. He was in the military before he became a teacher. And so these two guys suggested, I'm like, oh, maybe like, but yeah, things were getting so bad um, with my family. My mom and Shelly had split up by this point. Just, it was just so hard, man. Like just all of this drama that I realized like, where am I going to go after high school? Like, my mom and Shelly split up. We didn't really have a family home anymore. My mom moved in with some, you know, this other woman that she entered a relationship with. Shelly was uh, considering moving to Florida. And it was just like all this, like a, a lot of, a lot of, you know, that kind of stuff going on. And so I didn't know where I was going to go next. Um, and I figured, okay, the military, that's like a fast way to like hit the reset button and do something else with my life. You know, at the very least, I knew I'd have a job. At least I'd be employed. At least I'd have some money in my pocket. So I joined when I was 17, right after high school. I graduated at 17. It was, this was June. And I left in like August. So two months after after graduation, I shipped out for basic training. And yeah, it, was, it, was, it turned out to be like probably the most important decision I made, which was just sort of getting me out of Red Bluff, getting me out of all of that sort of drama and chaos that I was immersed in. Uh, and also getting me away. Like, honestly, like I, I love the guys I grew up with, but it was good that I got away from them um, considering where their lives ended up and where mine could have gone. Um, it was good that I got away from them too. New environment, sort of rigid structure, mentorship, camaraderie, discipline, all of those things. It was so helpful for me. I mean, it really, I think, helped to unlock a lot of the potential in me, all of the, I mean, I was a smart kid. I was a conscientious kid, curious kid, but it was just, one setback after another from my childhood. I mean, it was almost like, you know, I, I remember like, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I remember when I got to Yale, I spoke with another student uh, who came, you know, he, he was, he didn't grow up poor, but he was kind of like, you know, he didn't grow, he didn't go to private school or anything. It was like more middle class. And he was like, like, if you look around at these kids who went to like expensive schools, their lives were optimized, you know, like they were training their whole lives to go to a place like this. Like that's like their parents, everything around them was like, shaping them to attend a school like this and i remember hearing that thinking like my life was the opposite <laughs> or like my life everything like all of the wind was against me right like these kids had the wind on their back mine was like the wind and then some was like acting against me to ensure that i never entered a place like this uh and so it was just one thing after another but when i got to to, to the military suddenly all of the the weight had been lifted all of those obstacles i mean i it gave me a new environment new things to new new priorities good habits to like, you know, even, even like, yeah, simple things like showing up to work on time, punctuality, discipline, respect, all of those things were so helpful, especially as a young kind of misguided, angry young man, all of those things were super helpful. And then you ended up like, and then I think things came to a head also when you were in the military, like as far as like your mental health and your emotional health, I know you got addicted to alcohol and then ended up in a short stint with rehab. Talk about that experience and um, like how that propelled you even further, you know, along in your life. By the time this podcast comes out in the book, is it, so I've never actually talked about this, this publicly, the rehab stuff. Like I've written um, essays, public essays and done interviews and stuff talking about my life and, you know, talking about some of my ideas and everything. But the rehab um, chapter of my life is something I, I haven't talked about. I think some of it was, I, I, you know, it was, it was a little bit of shame, a little bit of self-consciousness. 
some of it is, um, yeah, I just, I just didn't know how to communicate it, but I figured, you know, if I was going to write this book, it had to be as honest and as authentic as I could be. And yeah, man. So, so my mom was a drug addict, my birth mother, which is why I was taken from her. And, you know, I think like in hindsight, sort of seeing the patterns of behavior that I had early on, you know, I think the predilection for addiction was definitely there, but part of it was just a matter of access. So in high school, it was still hard. Like it was hard to get beer. Like it was, you know, like I think people, you know, you go to high school parties and stuff. You always needed like an in, right? Like someone's older brother or like whatever, like finding the 21 year old who could get you beer uh, or alcohol or booze or whatever. It was like, it was always a bit of a challenge, but once I was old enough to buy my own alcohol and had my own apartment, had my own life, I was an adult. So there was the matter. Yeah. So, so just being able to obtain it whenever I wanted. Uh, and I could just come home and just drink myself to sleep every night and feeling like that was normal too. Um, I mean, part of it was like military has a bit of a drinking culture. Uh, and so I thought it was normal. Then the other thing was like, by the time I was 21, so I'd been in the military by that point, three or four years, my life had started to sort of even out and stabilize. And I was, be, you know, I was getting a bit older, a bit more self-reflective and thinking about everything I'd gone through. and. Yeah, it was like a way for me to shut down some of those feelings. Like as I, as I got a little bit older, I mean, I was still a young, young guy, but I started to think more about my early life, everything I'd gone through, you know, I'd go home once in a while. Like I, I would, I would make up reasons to not go home. Actually, I didn't go home for Christmas for the first, I think like six years, um, from 17 to 23, I was you know, part, I was just angry. I was upset. I was, you know, it was also like the family was broken, man. Like Shelly had moved out. My mom was living with this other person who I didn't know that well. You know, my sister was staying with her dad and it was just like the, the whole family had sort of shattered. And so I felt no need to go home. My mom would ask me to come home for Christmas and I would just tell her I had to work, but that was a lie. Um, I just didn't want to go home. And I was kind of running away from it. I was running away from everything I'd gone through. I wanted to sort of remake myself, remake my life, uh, forget that all of that stuff had ever happened to me. And so I think at this point, actually, I did indulge a little bit in that self-pitying mindset, a little bit of that victimhood stuff of like, man, I did go through a lot. And I used that as a, almost like as an excuse to drink, right? Like I could trade those little sort of victimhood points in for alcohol and drink and mistreat the people around me, my friends, girls I was dating. I was just a really, like, probably not a, not a pleasant person to be around. So yeah, at, at one point, so one of my friends uh, killed himself. He was a guy I worked with, I was stationed with him. He hanged himself. And I had just gotten out of a relationship uh, with this girl. And, you know, between that and like stuff that was going on with my family and stuff that was going on internally, just in a really dark place, and yeah, I just like one night I was already drunk, just kept drinking, kept drinking as much as I could um, to the point like I was in pain, like physically from from drinking so much and so fast and so quickly. I woke up in my bathtub um, and I was like 4 a.m. or something and just covered in vomit like all over me. And I hadn't drank to the point where I vomited on myself. I mean, I, I, eh, it's probably been a couple of years since I'd done that, but I got up tried to drink some water, started retching. I couldn't keep it down. Eventually, you know, I ended up in the ICU. The doc said I had alcohol poisoning. I told her how much I'd been drinking, how frequently. And this has been going on for a while. So yeah, she recommended that I go into the treatment center, spent six weeks in an inpatient rehab clinic. I was housed within a hospital. And yeah, just spent like six weeks just sort of reflecting and thinking and trying to understand why I'd been drinking so much, what I was running from, why, um, why this was the way that I decided to cope with all of it. And yeah, it ended up eventually, you know, speaking with the counselors there, speaking with the other patients, with everyone. Yeah. It just sort of helped me to realize, you know, everything that I'd gone through, it was a way for me to sort of attempt to quiet the inner demons and all the voices and all of the pain that I was in. It was a very sort of maladaptive way to do it and it ended up actually causing more pain and once i realized that and implemented some of the lessons that i learned while i was there 
I mean, notably just not drinking. I mean, that alone was enough to sort of improve my situation. Got out of there, came clean with my mom. You know, it was one of the things, you know, it's not just like stop drinking, but it's also just sort of what, what are some healthy behaviors and patterns and ways that you can improve your relationships. You know, a lot of those things that we talked about uh, when I was, uh, when I was there. And so, yeah, I told my mom about everything and how I was feeling and my sister and I ended up calling Shelly. I hadn't talked to Shelly in like seven years. Um, like literally since I left home, I didn't talk to her. Um, she didn't talk to me either. I remember feeling hurt by that, that, you know, of course I didn't talk to her. I never called her, but then she never called me either. And I always wondered why that was. But when we talked, I realized she was, she was also running. I mean, it was hard for her uh, to see the family broken up and, you know, it was just her way of dealing with it was my way of dealing with it. And so you just sort of reconnecting with the people around me, coming clean with them, being honest with myself, being honest with them, all of those things just sort of helped me to sort of reprioritize and realize that, you know, I shouldn't be someone who's trying to be so independent and so self-centered, self, self-important, self self-absorbed, just everything it was all about me and what I was going through and how I needed to get away and all of those things. And, and then to realize I actually, you know, what I should be doing is try to become someone who my family can rely on to try to be the kind of person that I wished I'd had when I was growing up. But it took me a long time to get there. I mean, I was probably 25. I really probably not until I was like 28 that I really had that realization. Um, but it took me a long time to get there that I shouldn't be running, but I should actually be um, trying to be that person that I, that I uh, lacked when I was a kid. You mentioned you were 28. Like what was going on in your life where all the collateral damage kind of came to a head? Um, well, okay. So, the, I mean, the, the age where all of that came to a head, I mean, I entered rehab. How old was I? 23 or 24, I think. This is like 20, 2014. I just remember. So I was in this hospital. The way that I tracked the time was uh, I remember CNN was playing in all the hospital uh, TVs, like in all the waiting rooms and everything. And this was when that um, that Malaysian airline uh disappeared that that airplane uh i don't know if you remember this this was like i want to say it was 2014 so i was 20 was i 25 i was 20 anyway um that was the year uh and so yeah i mean all of that stuff the, the stuff that you know that came to a head it was you know my friend killing himself my girlfriend dumping me my uh family life was a mess internally i wasn't doing well and yeah, that was, uh, yeah, that was the age of so 24, I think. And then by 28, so by that point I had graduated from college, right? I'd gone through the experiences at Yale and everything. I was 28 when I graduated, you know, uh, I was a super, super senior, you know, I was an old, old college student. Van Wilder. Did you ever see that movie? <laughs> yeah, I remember Van Wilder. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of like that, you know, it was funny. I don't even think the kids that I went to college with, I don't even think they know what Van Wilder was. You know, what was big then was, um, uh, they knew 21 jump street. So they would make those jokes to me. They were, you know, 21 jump street, these older cops pretending to be students or whatever. Like that's what they would, they would make the joke Oh, 21 jump street. And so, so yeah, by 28, uh, it was probably, yeah, the experiences in college, the experiences in rehab, military, everything, it just all kind of came together. And I realized like, why am I chasing success? Why am I trying to do well in my life? What's the point of all of this, of striving and improving and whatever, like getting an education, trying to make money. It was, yeah, to, to help my mom, to help my sister, to help my family. And then eventually when I get married and have kids myself, like to just be the kind of dad that I never had, basically, um, that was the kind of realization. It was just perspective and maturity and sort of outlook that sort of kind of hit me all at once um, at that age, yeah. So what have you done to cope with everything that you've gone through? Um, have you therapy, anything like that? Uh, well, when I was a kid, I, I had uh, the, the, the state of California ordered whatever court order that I had to go to therapy just because of all the foster homes and everything, the divorce. So I, when I was a kid, I went to therapy. In rehab, I you know basically I saw a counselor a couple times a week. After that, I didn't really see, no, I didn't really have any, yeah, I've never gone out of my way. Sometimes I thought about it. Should I, I feel okay now. Um, but in terms of coping, yeah, it's just like a lot of writing, a lot of going to the gym, a lot of thinking, a lot of, yeah, being honest, right? Like, I mean, I talk to my sister a lot now. I mean, I, I've always, she and I have always been close. I mean, ever since, you know, I told you the story of how she gave me some toys and like, you know, we were always close when we were kids. Uh, but there was that period 
shortly after I left home where we stopped talking as much. And she's really the only one, right? Cause she's the only one who went through the same things that I went through. So she kind of knows, so, you know, speaking with her a lot, um, all of that stuff has helped, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's still a struggle. That's the thing, right? It never completely goes away. You know, I did, I got, yeah, I did diagnosed with alcohol dependency, with addiction, with, um, uh, depression. And I mean, weirdly enough, I mean, by the time I left rehab, by the time I started sort of getting my life in order on track, um, I realized like a lot of the, the alcohol stuff, I mean, that was really, it wasn't the alcohol itself. It was the, it was a response to sort of running. And so I don't know, you know, like I'm pro I probably do have this sort of genetic predilection for it, but I find that I can drink now and it's fine. Like I don't, I don't spiral out of control anymore. Maybe it's just getting older. Maybe it's aging. I don't know what it is. The depression that does sort of kick in from time to time. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's just, uh, I, I, weirdly, I just find that pretending as if I'm not depressed helps, <laughs> you know, like just like, I, I don't want to go and hang out or do this or that or the other, but I'm just going to go do it. And more often than not, I mean, it's not perfect, but I, I find that most of the time at the least it helps, you know, even if it doesn't completely dissipate, it kind of waxes and wanes. I find that during winter, you know, it can kind of get that sort of seasonal stuff going with the depression and just sort of deal with it, manage it, spend some time writing and, exercise and all that kind of helps, you know, different, different ways, but yeah, much healthier than, than what I used to do, which was, you know, fighting and drinking and playing the choking game. Yeah. <laughs> choking. Game. That was a wild story in, in the book. And I encourage people to, to get the book so they can read more, read more about that. Cause it was just insane. Like everything that you went through and it's super inspiring that you're doing what you're doing now and that you're able to have conversations like this. I'm interested in the role that like your environment, the people you spend time with has played in all of this. Cause I know now you spend time with other people that are doing the work that you're doing. I know that Jordan Peterson has had a big impact on your life and that you've, it seems like become friends with him and, you know, doing stuff for his Academy and stuff. You know, I, I I've coined this phrase, you know, it's what I swear I say, surround yourself with people who have common futures and not common pasts. And I think that a lot of people, have a hard time with this, especially given your situation where you were in the same environment as a lot of your friends and you managed to to crawl your way out of it. What advice do you have for somebody who's listening to this that is trying to let go of some of those people that maybe they're not inherently bad people, but they're just not bringing the best out on you as far as your behavior? You know, what kind of what kind of thoughts would you have for them to be able to break away from that and spend time with people that are bettering themselves? Yeah, it's so hard because like for me, like, I know that if I had stayed where I was after high school, stuck around with my old friends, I mean, out of the five friends that I had, you know, there's like a crew of six of us, two went to prison. Uh, one one's kind of had this sort of menial job, but he ended up joining the military, did an enlistment for six years, got out, and now he works at a restaurant. He's kind of, he's doing okay uh let's see. yeah one friend is a he's a um a car dealer at a casino so he's like you know it's okay it's a decent job he's he's doing all right and how yeah, was the the other friend yeah i mean the other actually yeah the other friend i mean i i just i spoke with an old high school friend one of one of the friends that i've mentioned before but he's this this other friend of mine uh in the book uh christian he um yeah he attempted suicide and now i actually don't know what's going on with him but they found him in a bathtub wrist cut like you know he's he had a really tough tough early life i mean yeah um and i and i describe a little bit of it uh in the book too we, were, we used to be best friends um but yeah those are sort of the paths that my friends took and um so because i made that impulsive decision to enlist it just got me out of there right like i didn't have a choice it wasn't like oh i'm gonna make better friends now and try to like you know it was just like you, know, you ship out for basic training and now the military tells you what to do and these are your new friends and these are your new peers like that's just kind of how it went as far as like advice go i mean yeah i i'm i don't know if i'm the best person to ask just because i had that you know that that unusual um experience but i would say yeah just i don't know if it's so much i mean it's great to have who have it's, it's good to have friends who want the best for you. Jordan has this line I've heard him say of, you know, you, you want friends who want the best for the best version of you because, you know, the, the, that, you know, the, the, the original adage of making friends who want the best for you, that's kind of unclear, but the best for the best version of you, you know, that, that makes it more, I think, 
comprehensible. Maybe more important than that is to avoid people who want the worst for you, or at least want the best for the worst version of you. Maybe that's one way of thinking about it, of like friends who want you to drink. Yeah. If you have friends who every time you hang out with them, it's just about drinking alcohol, boozing up, getting, getting drugs or getting into mischief or, or even just like sitting around and complaining about how tough your life is. I mean, just sort of cutting those people out or, or at least sort of reducing the amount of time you spend with them. I think that's, that's important too. whatever disconnecting. I know some, some like podcasters and people, they call it like monk mode, right? Of just sort of, you know, doing your work, keeping your head down, trying not to try not to sort of get caught up in the drama and the chaos and whatever of the people around you. Um, so I think step one is to, yeah, just sort of spend less time with, with friends who maybe pull you in bad directions. And then from there, once you have that time freed up to start focusing elsewhere on where can I find better friends, um, whether it's at the gym, whether it's a local sports team, whether it's, I don't know, yeah, maybe you join the military, who knows, but just some, you know, that was the other thing too. Like, even when I was in the military, I did sort of, I could kind of tell, I don't, I, I don't know if I could sort of, if I would have verbally had a good explanation for why I was able to do this, but I could sort of detect, you know, like which, which, which guys were sort of going in positive directions in their life which one of these guys were focused or on their way to success. And I was able to sort of latch onto them and sort of learn from them and pick up some of their, their good habits too. So if there are people, you know, you don't have to be in the military to find people like that. People, you know, could be coworkers, colleagues, family members, whoever, surely there's at least one person in your life who's doing pretty well, or at least better than maybe they should, given their circumstances, try to learn from them and, and uh, build a relationship with them. Last question I have for you is, how is everything that you've gone through, like how has it shaped who you are today and how you carry yourself, how you treat other people? I mean, probably a bit more sympathetic in some ways. I mean, it's, 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 it's a double-edged kind of thing where on the one hand, I'm more sympathetic and compassionate because I understand, you know, when people have difficulties in their life, how it can hurt them. But on the other hand, you know, I do have this kind of this other side of me, the more stern side of like, look, people like everyone struggles, everyone has difficulties. I had to, you know, like when I talked to some of my old high school friends and seeing the choices they're making, I'm thinking like, no one's forcing you to do this either. You know, like we have, we have to exercise some agency and some control over our lives too. We can hold both of those ideas in mind at the same time of yes, on the one hand, living a very difficult early life, you know, whether it's poverty or instability or maltreatment, neglect when you're a kid, those things will affect you later. That's true. But, you know, those serve as explanations, but those, they're not justifications. They're, you know, the, just because you were treated that way or whatever doesn't give you the excuse to treat other people that way or to treat yourself that way, uh, as difficult as it is to sort of get around that and to rise above it. And then, yeah, I mean, the other thing is just trying to spend more time sort of helping people. I did this a lot when I was in college of, you know, I volunteered as a, as a tutor, uh, for, for local kids who were having difficulties in school or who were sort of reading behind their grade level. So I spent a lot of time tutoring kids and, um, the military helped me a lot too. So then later I, I, um, did some volunteer work to help veterans uh, get into college. And I find all of those things to help. Um, you know, I mentioned the depression and those kinds of things earlier. It was just, when I'm helping other people, I sort of forget my own troubles. You know, I think people sort of miss or they, they, they kind of, what people underestimate how much helping others can make them feel better. Right. Cause we have this kind of individualistic culture, which isn't always a bad thing, but I think we do get too caught up in our own heads and our own struggles. But once we sort of turn our attention outward, how can I help this person? Um, and then you actually find like, you know, the effort that you're putting into them and they're helping, uh, to improve their own lives and they're succeeding. It really is nice to see, to see sort of, you know, take, applying the lessons that I learned and using it to help other people. Yeah. I find that's, that's actually surprisingly rewarding more than I, more than I would have thought. Um, but yeah, it's a, that, that's, that's a, where I direct a lot of my attention. I love that. Well, Rob, thank you so much, man, for coming on here and just sharing so openly and honestly and, and for being so vulnerable. I really appreciate it. I know the audience is going to enjoy the conversation as well. If people want to get the book, if they want to connect with you, where's the best place to do that? Um, I mean, you can go to my, my website, robkhenderson.com, and the book is sold, you know, Amazon and everywhere else. 
Uh, and then, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Twitter slash X, whatever it's called now, uh, at Rob K. Anderson, and you can find me there too. So yeah, this has been great. Thank you, Doug. You got it, man. And I'll be sure to include the links to that stuff in the show notes. And uh, once again, man, thank you so much for coming on. The audience is going to love this one. Thanks, Doug. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.